This is Julian, and I'm here with best-selling author Robert Greene, who just released his new book, The Laws of Human Nature. I'll put a link to it here below, as it is a must-read. And what I thought we could do here is just jump right in on the importance of learning about human nature, like one, why someone should learn this. And I wouldn't even say importance, I would say necessity, like why someone is really screwed without learning about what you talk about in this book. The point of my book is that the major source of pain in your life is people, the people around you. And um, you're not maybe thinking in these terms, but I will, I'll explain what I mean in the following way. So we want to be able to feel like in life with our friends, our colleagues, our loved ones, that we can influence them, that we can move them in our direction, that we have the ability to persuade them to do something that's in our interest. Mm. And the feeling that we can't do that is deeply painful. It causes lots of amounts of frustration and resentment that can sit inside of us and linger and kind of ruin our attitude towards life. Um, sometimes there are toxic people in this world and they enter our life and we're not, lives and we're not, we didn't foresee them. You know, someone who's a raging narcissist or whatever, and we get dragged into a relationship with them, or we hire them as a business partner or an employee, and they ruin our lives, and they cause all kinds of emotional damage that can take years to, to get over. Mm -hmm. And then another level is we have um, friends and partners and spouses, and sometimes the connections between them between us are very fragile and thin. Our friendships are continually breaking up. Our friends do something that surprises us and upsets us. And so we often find that our relationships with people are not, we're not connecting to them on a deep level. Mm -hmm. So you add all this up, sort of frustration and resentment that we have no influence over people. Bad types that enter our lives and cause us kind of residual pain and then relationships that aren't really strong and aren't connecting. And you add all that up and you can have, as a social animal, that can, that can equal a great deal of pain. Mm -hmm. And that can, you know, we don't associate it this way, but a lot of, of, of illnesses and heart disease are um, associated with loneliness. And I think a lot of people feel, especially in this world today, a bit of alienation and disconnect from other people. And so this is a book that I think can reverse that process. And I believe that in the world that we're living in today with social media and technology, that most of us find ourselves withdrawing. We're, we're, we're immersed in our, in our smartphones, etc. We're not connecting in, in any deep, deeper way. So these kind of tendencies and this pain that I'm talking about is actually getting worse. And so this is a book about how to reverse that, how to recognize those toxic people well in advance before you get entangled in their mess, yeah. before you become enmeshed in their dramas, how to learn how to the real way towards influencing people, towards working with their willpower to get them to do what you want so you don't feel this constant frustration and then how to connect to people on a much deeper level as a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk a lot in this book about empathy. And as a social animal that we are, um, we have this ability to understand people in a way that's nonverbal, where we can connect to them in a kind of visceral way through our empathy. And I can begin to understand what it's like to be Julian. Mm -hmm. I'm not you, I can't be inside your head. I can't know you from the inside out, but I can get closer to that. We have an almost telepathic power if we tap into it, but we don't tap into it because we're so immersed in ourselves. We're so self-absorbed. Yeah, there's a quote that I love. It says that today we're more connected than ever with you know, social media, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, our phones, but we're also more alone than ever. You know? right. And we do live in that virtual world. Like right now, I mean, the example I always use is you don't even have to, if you think of, say, pursuing a purpose or pursuing something that you love, you don't have to go out of the house to do that. Like someone could get lost in a video game. Like back in the day, it was like World of Warcraft. And 
in that game, you could just stay at home and it f virtually fulfills all of your needs to some extent where you can create tribes, you can socialize in there, you can level up so you have that sense of accomplishment, there's different quests, and you never leave the, the house. And because of that, it's like you lose touch with what you said, like that empathy, like the dynamics of understanding a person because you're just in this 2D virtual realm. I think we've all had this experience. If you've ever been, for whatever reason, alone a lot, let's say you had an illness or let's say you're depressed or let's say you're in a foreign country, you'll notice that when you're suddenly thrust among people, you feel a little bit awkward. It takes a minute, a little while to adjust. But in the opposite, if you're very social, if you're always around people, you're going to events and you're meeting a lot of them, something kicks in and it's, it's easy to be around them and you've, you're more attuned to people. Well, we're not around people enough. Mm -hmm. We're not interacting with them. We're interacting with them virtually or we're immersed in our technology. And so for just by the fact that you're out there socializing with people, one-on-one -on -one communication, you're going to develop this skill. We're animals. We're living, breathing animals. Mm -hmm. We have blood and heart, and we connect to people viscerally, physically. I see your eye contact. I'm able to connect with you on that level. I'm able to hear the tone of your voice. I'm able to read your body language. We read people in a way that we're not even conscious of. We read, pick up signals that people are giving off through their nonverbal communication. And when you're not paying attention, I, I mean, I notice in restaurants there'll be couples and neither of them are looking at each other. They're both like, like this. Buried on the phone, yeah, yeah. So you're missing all of this information that people are giving out about themselves, about their likes, about what excites them, about what makes them an individual. You're missing all of that because you're not paying attention. Yeah, I would see it for years because, I mean, I've taught it for years when it comes to just interacting with other people. It's like, learn about the different dynamics, learn about the context, like who's this person? What are they feeling right now? What is appropriate to the situation while still remaining authentic? And I would see less and less of this skill because it is a skill, it's something you develop. Yes. And it would shock me, I'm like, how do people not know this? To the point where it was even during, say a seminar room context, like yeah. that's the context. Because people are so used to taking in information online, like watching this video here, yeah. there's the, the comment box below. Or if you're watching a webinar, there's the chat box where you can just leave your comments, um, ask your questions. And I would see where, where in seminar rooms, I would be, you know, quite a few times just randomly interrupted, like someone just raising their hand and blurting something out because they're like, well, where's the comment box? Where is it? And they weren't aware of the context that it's a seminar room, there's real people. And, you know, by just spending so much time online, it's like you try to act in the real world with the online rules, but that's not how it works. I would, in all honesty, attribute a lot of my success or where I'm at today due to social intelligence, learning how to read people. It's like, if you don't know this, you close off so many doors. Right. Like if, you have, if you're at the bottom and you're starting out and you want to enter different scenes or network your way up, or even there's that famous quote, you know, surround yourself with the five people, you know, those are the people who influence you the most. If you don't have the basic social intelligence to create just no downside, right. you're not gonna move up at all, right. you know? And then of course, in terms of reading yourself, and, and that's what I love about this one too. It's like, of course, reading other people, but then I always turn the mirror around on you. Like, how am I doing this? What about me? What is running me? The most important law of human nature is that we deny that there is such a thing as human nature. So I have chapters on all of these sort of primal forces that I believe govern us. Mm -hmm. Our irrationality, the fact that emotions control us, the fact that uh, we are, tend to be self-absorbed and that we're all sort of narcissists, that we are prone to feeling envy, to constantly comparing ourselves to other people, that we have a dark side, that we have aggressive tendencies. But when we think of, the, of these things, it's always the other person. I'm rational and you're irrational. I care about people, you're the narcissist. I'm a nice, wonderful person, you're aggressive or passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. I never feel envy. I don't really have a dark side. We have a tremendous need to feel of ourselves as being superior. 
Now, I'm not trying to bum you out with this book or make you depressed, but I think by understanding yourself better, by understanding that you're not nearly as great as you think you are, Mm -hmm. that you do have these tendencies, you actually can begin to change yourself. You know, we... The self-help genre is a huge genre. I'm, I'm definitely within it. But a lot of books, we read books and we, they don't really lead to any kind of change because they don't challenge us. They're not looking at the reality of who we are. And I believe you can't change yourself and can't get out of these bad patterns that you're probably locked into unless you actually look at who you are. You actually understand that you are subject to many of these forces that I talk about. Yeah, it's true. Most traditional self-help books that we read is all about like you know positive thinking or like something that'll reinforce how good of a person I am like we kind of scan through it we have that bias where we just block out things that challenge us it's like how amazing you are of course I'm going to read that tell me how amazing I am as opposed to here's what's really going on beneath the surface do this in-depth audit on yourself you know right. confront your inner demons that's like no, but the you know. but the beauty of the book is that, or the, of what I'm trying to say, is that we are all the same. That nobody is exempt from this. this that nobody is actually superior. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're worse than other people. It's just this is who we are. So if because of our nature, because of how we evolved from millions of years ago, we have a tendency to get caught up in the emotions of other people, viral effects, emotional contagion. Why would it be that some people are exempt from that and others are not? No, we are all subject to these forces. And it's better to be realistic and look at it than to be someone that's avoiding the truth of the reality. I think too many self-help books try and compliment the reader. Mm -hmm. Say you're really, you know, this this is holding up a kind of idealistic image of who they are. I'm the opposite. I'm trying to show that you're actually as screwed up as, as other people are, and it's better to confront it and turn this around somehow. Yeah. Yeah, no, that I absolutely love. And it's what I talk about in a lot of my videos too. It's like confronting, you know, as you'd call it, like your shadow or right. Carl Jung, you know, the shadow. It's like face those inner demons. Like stop living in this state of denial with this split inside of us where we're just like, I'm this acceptable exactly. me. It's like, no, own everything that is you and dive into that. And then, of course, we have layers and layers of resistance to doing so. But as you said, until you do, I mean, it's there either way and it's active and running you, whether you're aware of it or not. So become aware and then be thankful that you're aware so then you can do something about it, which you talk about in your book here. Yeah, like you do have aggressive tendencies. We all have aggressive tendencies. It's our nature and I explain why we have them. And if you're aware of that, you can take that energy that we all have and actually channel it into something productive. If you stop denying it, and you realize you have this energy, you can turn it into being ambitious and pouring that aggression into becoming something great, into making something great, into using that energy to fuel your persistence, to push past any kind of adversity, to be aggressive when it comes to getting your way and getting what you want. And I even talk about the positive aspects of anger and how to channel your anger into your work. I use a lot of anger in my books because I am angry about people's hypocrisies and the stupidity that we constantly confront. And I use that anger to fuel my writing. But instead of getting angry at people and pissing them off and making a lot of enemies, I channel it into my work, into my books. You can channel your anger and your frustrations into your work. There's many ways to take that aggressive energy and make it productive, but you won't do that if you deny that you even have these tendencies. Even reading that and seeing, as you said, that it's not just you, I think will also help, you know, relieve a lot of self-attack or self-hate that we carry because it's really that resistance to, say, feeling angry because we're conditioned that way. It's like, don't feel angry. So then when you're angry, not only are you angry, but then you're beating yourself up and you're angry that you're angry and you're angry that you're angry that you're angry. And when you see, like, you know, one, it's part of who we are. There's nothing wrong with you. Like you have a certain emotion for a reason. Yeah. And two, this is everyone. It kind of relieves a little bit of that, you know, angry, feeling angry, feeling angry. Right. And then also just seeing the value in every emotion. Like it's there for a reason. Right. Um, but what does eat us up inside is when we resist it too much and then becomes this permanent state that we just live in. You know, right. we can't escape it. Right. Um, and I, you, I love your first law too. It's like that law of rationality. Uh-huh. 
where even going back to what we were saying before, learning how to read someone, if you don't dive into yourself and like confront what is running you, you're going to be projecting that onto the person and you won't even have the accurate data to, to, to read them. You right. know, an exercise that I love doing at um, some of my live events, it's like, say, like, say we've, we've never met, we're just sitting here, we're just complete strangers and we're paired up in a group. Pick the person without telling them that you dislike the most. Now you don't say it, everyone picks a person. And then you gotta ask yourself, okay, what about that person? Like, why did I pick that person? What about them? And then kind of dive into that and you paint the picture. They're allowed to get negative. So it's like, you know what? That person, they seem stupid. Or that person, they seem like they're above the rest of the group. They seem like they know it all. You say this, you actually say this. I'll, I'll paint out some examples, but oh. then they say it in their head. Oh, like they won't say it to the person like you. Uh -huh. And then throughout the, the seminar, they get to know the other person. And they realize like how off they were right, and how right, it right. all came from them. And it's right. like, whoa, you know, if, if that's what you're projecting and then you're trying to, you know, calibrate and read the person based on that, which has nothing to do with who they are, right. you're completely off, you know? Yeah. Um, look at it this way. You, I'm trying to tell you that you don't understand the people that you're dealing with. You really don't know who they are. You're walking around thinking that you know your wife or your husband, your children, your boss, your friends, but you really don't have a clue. Yeah. You don't understand their experience. You don't really know what they think of you actually as well. Most of the time you're projecting onto them your own images. Let's say, you know, you had particularly bad relationship with your father or your mother and uh, you don't like people in authority because of the relationship to your father and so you meet somebody who's powerful who has authority and you hate them you have a bad instant reaction because you're projecting onto them some image from your own childhood mm -hmm. so you don't see the people that are in front of you you're not seeing them you're not understanding them and what happens when you operate in darkness when you, do, when you operate without knowledge, you make mistakes. You say something very stupid that offends the other person. You don't even realize that you've offended them. And weeks later, you notice that they're kind of cold and they're not responding to your texts and your emails. You have no idea why, because you probably did offend them in some way, because you don't know who they are, you don't know their experience, you don't know what's going on inside of them or what their likes and aversions are. So. If you stop for a moment and tell yourself, damn, I don't know the, what the people around me are really thinking about me, it's a startling revelation and you're going to want to change that. Just realizing this, you're like, whoa, like how much we project and even how much, you know, going back to like the state that runs us also colors our perception. Like say you're someone who's in a state of anger, that's going to color your focus. Like what you focus on, you're like, you know what, is it a little hot in here? Oh, what time is it? Oh, I'm a little tired, et cetera, et cetera. If you're in a state of fear, you're going to be like, do I look good? What are people thinking of me? It like, it colors literally what you see even looking at another person. Like you don't see them for who they actually are. I do want to bring it back to, to reading other people. And this is what I loved. It's like, you know, when you hear this, like learn to read different cues, different dynamics. It's like, of course, um, there's the classic like, okay, body language, et cetera, et cetera. But then what I loved here is look at, you know, the patterns that are running them or when they're triggered, you know, like what triggers them? It goes like that layer deeper of like, what is, also running them not just the surface but like really piercing through and understanding who they are even linking it back to their childhood so on and so forth so i'm trying to say that people have a character and that what i mean by that is it's their core it's who they are it's something very deep it comes from their dna it's, there's a genetic component it comes from their early childhood and the kind of attachment they had to their parents it comes from their early experiences with friends and teachers and at school and it makes them who they are and their character tends to be revealed in certain things that you must pay attention to and the reason it's so important is you want to be able to judge people by their character you want to know what runs them from deep deep within because if you don't if you make a mistake you will hire them as a business partner or you'll get involved in a relationship and it will be a disaster because you didn't see that actually they have very negative patterns and they only come out later. So I want you to be able to look at the people you're dealing with and literally see their character. And I give you a, some clues and tips on how to do that. First of all, 
people have patterns of behavior. Nobody ever does anything once. So let's say if somebody sent you an angry email that defended you, and then they go, oh, I'm sorry, but that's not who I was. Something came over me. You know, I'm not like, I'm not that person. You will probably accept that, but the truth is they never did that once. They probably, it's a pattern. They've done it many times. If they've screwed you in some way, they've screwed 10 other people in their past. You want to see people's patterns of behavior, the kind of compulsive element in them. Okay, that'll show you something very deep in their core. You also want to look at them in the moments where their guard is down. You know, we all wear masks. We all try to present ourselves as being noble and great. But the mask comes down in certain elements. So you want to look at how they treat their children, their spouse, their employees. They might be nice to you because they want something out of you. But when their back is turned and they're talking to other people, they're the biggest raging asshole around. That gives you signs of they're trying to disguise this from you. But in the little details of life, they kind of reveal who they are. You want to see how they react under pressure. People under pressure reveal something ele- elemental about themselves. If they get hysterical, if they get prone to, to you know, pointing fingers and blaming other people, right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> if people have power, if they suddenly gain power, if they're elected to an office or they're made manager or whatever, they suddenly will reveal elements of their character. They will either become someone who's kind of ugly and power-hungry and manipulative, or, which is much rarer, it will reveal that, they, the, you know, that they're very responsible and they can handle power well. Mm-hmm. So these are signs where people reveal, they almost ooze out of them unconsciously, of who their character is, of who they really are. And I want you to train you, the reader, not to look at people's appearances, not to look at their smiles and the masks they wear and the compliments they pay you, but to pay attention to these other deeper signs that they are revealing of something much below the surface that is actually going on inside them. Look at the little signs that people give off. If someone is habitually late, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, there's traffic, or I had so much work to do, whatever. But actually, it's a sign that they feel kind of superior to you, that they feel that they're more, their time is more important than yours. And these little details that people are constantly giving out, you see signs of, of who they really are, yeah. but you're not paying attention to them. Yeah, another thing I love focusing on is, um, I, I know you talk about it too, like looking into the eyes, like into the pupil and just seeing... Like, of course, you can tell on a surface, like, if someone's a little bit more restricted, like, nervous. But otherwise, like, going even deeper and asking yourself, like, is someone even there? Like, how present are they? Right. As opposed to kind of, like, retracted, like, into the mind, like, not fully present, like, in their head, analyzing, just not there. And you're like, huh, that's interesting. Or when they're, you know, triggered, like, something takes over, like, what is there, you know? Yeah, well, um, think of it in those moments in life when you're like falling in love with someone, right? And through their eyes, you're, the eyes are really connecting in that moment. Both eyes, sets of eyes are kind of mm-hmm. interacting and there's a powerful, powerful attraction going on through that. And the eyes then, that kind of looking and gazing and the pupils get dilated and there's excitement. It lights up the entire face. Yeah. The smile, the cheeks are raised, etc. And um, so people give off these signs of excitement or detachment all of the time. So if you're trying to influence someone or if you're trying to seduce someone, you want to be able to pick up those signs that you're having an effect on them through the eyes. Through, mm-hmm. you know, I talk a lot about distinguishing between a real smile and a fake smile. Yeah. A real smile kind of lights up the whole face and it also lights up the eyes. And then you know that you're connecting with that other person. Whereas that fake kind of tight smile that a lot of people have, you know that, that, that there is no connection going on. Yeah, and building on that, like looking at the smile, but also when they smile and like what topics or dynamics like turn them on. Right. You know, like that too. If you, you can even test someone, and I know you talk about this, like 
if you share some good news, how do they react? Right. As opposed to some bad news or some gossip. Like, what topics turn them on and you can get a better reading of what's running them, what's there? Yeah, you can test people sometimes. If you think that you're dealing with someone who's envious mm. or passive aggressive, you can tell them some particularly good news that you've had. There's a micro expression, which is something that a lot of uh, psychologists have, have documented, like Paul Ekman, which is like half of a millisecond, where for a moment they're, they're, they're kind of frowning and they put a fake smile up to disguise that. And you can pick that up. They're not really happy about your good news. Or you tell them something bad that's happened to you. You lost this job, your girlfriend left you, and you notice for a moment a kind of happiness on their face, which they then try and hide by pretending to be kind of yeah. sympathetic to you. So you can test people. But also, um, you want to notice those things. That, so you're in a conversation with a person, and you happen to touch upon a subject that excites them. That's the kind of information that's extremely important to gather, you know, and you can tell by the tone of their voice and by the look in their eye. They reveal that. You know, I know for myself, if people talk suddenly about the Lakers mm. or basketball, I get really excited. I can't help it because I'm such a basketball junkie, you know, and my whole body language changes. But if conversely, if there's a subject that I really don't like to talk about, like you know, cancer or some terror, you know, mm. subject like that, my whole body language changes. You're missing these signals that people are giving out in your conversation, but they reveal a lot about the likes and dislikes of, uh, of these individuals and how you can appeal to them. And even turning the mirror around on you, it's like when, you know, if you're watching this, when do you light up? And it's not about judging yourself. Like you may be watching this and you're like, man, I do light up when it's bad news or when it's gossip. You know, if someone comes up, it's like, it's like that's, it, it sounds weird to say when I feel alive. Like I remember myself way back in the day, if I was hanging around positive people and say we're all joking around, I could fit in, but it required a lot of energy and effort. And when I left that environment, I would feel drained. I was like, oh, now I can finally go back to me, you know, and, and my friends where we kind of gossip and stuff. Oh, I see. So the gossiping, gave me energy. That's where I could feel at home uh -huh. as opposed to the positive people where it, it required effort. Uh -huh. And then you can kind of audit yourself there. Like now it's more so like, hey, when I'm positive, I feel more energetic and, and it, alive as opposed to the opposite. So you can follow like what gives you energy around who do you feel at home? Right. What topics do you feel at home? It says a lot about who you are. Yeah. So then it's like turning the mirror like, okay, that's interesting. And without going on the self attack, you know, train, it's like, well, why is that? You know, like diving into yourself. And I really love how you keep bringing it back to, to our childhood because we always yeah. tend to ignore that. It's like you hear advice, you know, always focus on the future. Don't look back. But it's like, well, if you don't look back, you're going to keep repeating those same patterns. Right, right. You have to look back to do something about it to change the future. And I know a lot of people have resistance where they're like, well, my childhood is great. You know, my parents were together. They're a loving couple. I had a great childhood. I don't have any of these you know, frustrations or patterns that run me. I haven't suffered any kind of childhood trauma, but no one is exempt from this. And then it's really changing too how small things impact us because our perception is just so limited and different as a child. Like right. even being lost in a grocery store could be traumatic, right. you know? So everyone has this and then it's really going back and like, okay, well, you know, what did happen? Like what were my parents like? What did they value? What got passed on to me? Right. How was their relationship like? Because I'll see that a lot. Say, you know, your parents um, fight a lot. As a kid, you're going to look at that and you're going to form like this core belief of like, that's what love is. That's what a relationship right. is. And then you keep gravitating towards that in your adult life because that's at the foundation of your, your map of understanding. Yeah. You know, or if someone, your parents are divorced, you're going to fall for people who leave you or that's who right. cheat on you, who are, who are not there for you. And it's like right. these constant patterns and we refuse to dive back and analyze why and, and learn how to process that. So I love that you brought that in. Yeah, everything that happens in the present, I want you to look back and see the roots of it in your, in your early past. Mm -hmm. And think of it this way, when you were a child, you were extremely open and vulnerable, much more than you are now. As we get older, we become defensive and the walls go up and we're, we're more trying to protect ourselves from people. 
But when you're a child, you're extremely open and extremely vulnerable to the energy of the people around you. Those first few months with your mother, if that's who you spent your first few months with, are critical. So much of the energy from that mother was absorbed into your spirit and creates patterns of behavior. The same can happen with your father, and the same thing happens with your siblings. And so I want you to examine this in depth. In each of the chapters, I go and show you the roots in your childhood. So, for example, I, I, I talk in the book about, uh, let's say, a boy whose mother was not really there for him, whose mother was kind of a narcissist, and whom he almost had to pay more attention to, to her, make sure he didn't hurt her, then she paid to him, kind of the reverse of the usual parental relationship. Well, as that boy gets older, he's going to tend to project this onto other people. His greatest worry in life is that some people are going to abandon him, mm -hmm. like his mother abandoned him when he was a child. And so he gets into a relationship into his 20s, and he's with a woman, and for a moment, she acts in a way that's not so friendly or a little bit cold. And he immediately feels, oh my God, she's about to abandon me. She's about to break up. And he gets hostile and he initiates an argument of some sort, etc. He never realizes this person that the root of this pattern of this animosity or this antagonism with his partner stems from a great fear that was embedded in him in his early childhood, this fear of abandonment. And it constantly creates a pattern throughout his life, over and over and over again. He's the one that abandons the other person before they can abandon him. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have to deal with that trauma. Well, there's all sorts of things like that that are embedded in you. Even if you think you had a golden childhood, nobody had as good a childhood as they believe. Because you're, you're in, in retrospect, you think everything was wonderful. But actually, children are very insecure, are very susceptible, are very vulnerable, and are constantly feeling emotions of fear and anxiety mm -hmm. and resentment and anger and hostility that we don't realize later on, but they're very much within us. And so your childhood contains keys to who you are in the present. Yeah. And not all of it's bad, some of it's really good. So I have a chapter in this book about discovering what you were meant to do in life, your purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And the key to that is to see who you were as a child and what you were naturally drawn to and what you were naturally repulsed to, you know, the fields and the activities that excite you the most. So your childhood also contains keys to who you can become. Yeah, one could even argue with the patterns that nothing really changes since your childhood until you address it. Like on the surface, you know, the physical world changes, but it's those same patterns. Like the friends and the role you take on as a kid, you keep putting yourself in those same situations. Like if you're someone who is the class clown in the friends or the person who's at the bottom who people tolerate, but they're not gonna go out of their way to see you, you think that when you grow up or even like you move, it'll change. Everything will change if I just move. But you just find your way back in that same role just with new people. You project right. your father and your mother on new people. Right. Um, your ceilings of success when it comes to like your health, your wealth, your relationship, it's like you keep sabotaging when you go above what you believe you deserve right. and it just manifests in all these different ways. So you think things are changing, but it's just this repeat of the same dynamics, right. the same trauma, so on right. and so forth. And I love what you said too with um, when you're a child, you're a lot more vulnerable. And it's true, we fail to see that like, you're more vulnerable, you depend on your parents to survive or whoever is raising you because if they get rid of you, you, you die. Right. And your perception is very limited. Like you don't know what the world is or countries right. are. Right. Even in a classroom, your world is the classroom. Right. If you don't fit in the classroom, you think you're gonna explode, you know? Right. And something is you know, trivial is like even a parent saying, say you're at a restaurant, like I love this example because that was me. I remember I was told, I don't remember, um, that I was in this restaurant and I said very loudly like, mom, is this dead cow? Like really loud. And everyone was staring. She was like, shh, don't say that. But even something like that, like, shh, you know, be quiet in a restaurant. Their intention is good. But then the way I interpret that is they don't love me right now. If they don't love me, they could abandon me. I could die. Traumatic. Right. And then like we start, never be loud again. Right. Or in a classroom, if someone finds out that you like a girl and the whole class teases you, that's right. traumatic as well. And then we fail to look at that 
in our adult life where, you know, as you call it, like being triggered. It's like, go say hi to this girl. That same experience, like that same, oh, I'm going to die if I do this that you had in your childhood surfaces. Or speak up in front of, uh, in public or in front of a, a crowd. People can't do that. Like public speaking is one of the biggest fears people have because it goes back to that. And we try to find little tools to fight against it instead of get to right. what you harp on a lot, get to the cause, get to the source of it all. Right, because then you can possibly change it. Then you can begin to break out of those patterns that you have. Yep. So if you understand that you are the one projecting this fear of abandonment or hostility onto other people, then you can stop it. Mm -hmm. You can stop it and you can realize that that woman you thought was about to abandon you was actually just in a bad mood or just was dealing with something else. And then you can break out of this horrible pattern that's ruining your life. Yeah. But you can only begin to do that when you confront your own demons, when you confront these elements in your character that are causing you to repeat over and over again the same thing. One thing I want to do in this book, and I think it can really liberate you, is to not take anything personal. Now, I know that sounds like an ideal that's really difficult because we're always taking something personal. If someone says something, we get in an argument, or they say something that we perceive as hostile, we assume that they're being personal, that they're attacking us, they're attacking us for who we are, and we really are upset about it. Um, but nothing is really ever personal in the realm of social relations. Oh, not nothing, rarely is it. So that when a person shows anger towards you or resentment or some kind of negative emotion, 95% of the time they are dealing with their own emotions, their own problems, their own traumas, something from their childhood. Mm -hmm. So if you realize in that moment that they are frustrated not because of you, but because of the day that they were having, because of a phone call they had earlier in the day, because of problems rooted in their childhood, it frees you up from getting resentful and angry and creating these kind of spiraling misunderstandings. So if they are actually upset with you because of something that happened earlier in the day and you take it personally and you get a little angry, you then make them have a worse mood than they already had. And then they say something worse and then you get more upset. And Just ping pongs back and forth. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a descending spiral here. So you want to be able to break out of that. You want to be able to have feel free and not take things personally. You know, people don't mean it that way. They they're dealing with their own shit, their own problems. No one can ever truly know you at all, except for you. Like, I don't like I can get a, a feel for you, but I don't know every experience you went through your entire life, right. how it felt, how you interpreted it, how you experienced it. Even your parents or your closest friends or or no one knows that except for you. So because no one has all the facts, they can't actually approve of you or disapprove of you because they don't know who you are. They right. can just speculate or project, right. you know? And we take it as if they know everything that is us. Right. And then even looking at them, it's like another, well, another benefit, as you say, of looking past the mask is that we stop comparing everything that we know about ourselves with the surface front that we see. Because like we see that, they're so perfect. I'm comparing that perfect front to all my baggage and everything about me, self-attack, self-hate, spiral down. Yeah, it all stems from what we were talking about earlier, where you're not really seeing the people around you. Mm -hmm. You're not really dealing with the reality. You're dealing with an illusion. You're dealing with your own projections, and you're dealing with the mask that they present. So people are always showing you know, their best side, they love their job, they have a great um, partner, a great family, etc. And they tend to disguise the bad things, the, the depressions or the, the negative emotions that they're experiencing. And so you're feeling envy, you know, you feel, well, wow, God, my life isn't as good as their life. You know, if only I had their childhood, if only I had their loving parents. Mm. But you're not seeing the reality and probably if you got closer to them, if you were inside their family and you saw how they interact with their children and their spouse, you would realize that they're presenting to you this very idealized picture. That it's not as rosy as it looks. Yeah. And then you you don't have to feel envy. You don't have to compare yourself. I don't know if you've felt this, you out there in the world or you, uh, Julian, 
you're doing some project, you're doing some work, you're writing something, you're creating something, and you get into this flow where your focus is so deep on the work itself, and you feel really light, and you feel really excited, and there's no emotional baggage. You're just in the moment dealing with this project and making it great. And that's because there's nothing personal going on. You're not dealing with you know, issues with other people. You're just focused on this in a kind of rational way, right, in getting the project done. Well, if you could approach social life in the same way, where you have this flow, where people are just facts of nature, they just are who they are, they're not anything, they're not people that hate you or love you, etc. They just have their own problems, their own issues, and has nothing to do with you. If you can get into that sense where it's not about you and your emotions, you can feel that kind of light, liberating feeling that you have in your work, where you're, you're focused and things are just what they are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very, it's a very light, liberating feeling. I think like we're all dealing with an illusion that we live in a world of illusion, that we don't really see the people around us, that we're not dealing with who they are. We're dealing with this kind of mirage. Yeah. And sort of the red pill moment is what I'm trying to give in the book. Imagine if instead of this mirage, this illusion that you walk around with, where people project these images that aren't real at all, imagine if suddenly you could see into who they really were. Mm. If suddenly you could see behind the mirage, you could see what's really motivating you. You could begin to understand their thoughts and their emotions. It would blow you away. And the, and the world would completely change. Your, your whole vision of the world would change. And you would be fascinated by this. And you'd want to do more of it. You'd want to see more and more and more of what really lies underneath people. And I'm not saying I can do that completely in my book. I don't want to be so grandiose. But that's my goal in there, is to get rid of those illusions and that mirage that you have about people and actually begin to see who they really are. So I I talk in the book, I have stories. Each law is illustrated with a story. And in one chapter, I talk about this famous writer, Anton Chekhov, who had a really, really horrible childhood. His father beat him almost every single day. They lived in this miserable little village. um, And they were poor. Everyone in the family was fighting. The mother was really weak. And the father was just really abusive. And then suddenly the family, the father and his brothers moved to Moscow and they abandoned Anton at the age of 16 to live by himself in this miserable little village where he can maybe finish his schooling. And he starts to feel like insane amounts of resentment and hostility towards his family, towards his father who beat him every day, towards his mother who never stood up to him. And then at one point he realizes, he's walking in the streets in this miserable little village, and he realizes, what would happen to me if I suddenly got rid of all of these negative emotions towards people that are kind of obsessing my thoughts? What if I really tried to understand my father instead of hating him? And then he took a step back and he said, my father was born a serf. He was basically a slave who was later freed. And... His father beat him, and his father made him go into a profession that he hated. So naturally, he became an alcoholic, and naturally, he beat me, and he can't help it. And as he went through that process, he felt waves of love towards his father, like he could understand him, like he'd get inside his spirit. And he did the same with his mother. His mother couldn't help being passive, because that's how she was brought up, etc., And no wonder his siblings were so wounded by this childhood. And as he went through that process of understanding people and getting inside their story, he felt this insane liberation from all those negative feelings of hostility and resentment and bitterness. Oh, why was I born into this family? Oh, why did I grow up in this village? And he realized it was all for a purpose and it was fine. And going through that process, he actually began to see his father for who he really was not for this projection that he had, and it completely liberated him from all of his negative emotions. So that's a bit of the kind of feeling I think you can have by going through some of these processes that I described. One of the practices that really helped me 
shed a lot of light on like what was running me. It's like, you know, there, we all know like if you have a disease, what would change? You know, like what would happen if you found out like a horrible disease, like you have cancer? What would change? And immediately there's less of that split, that denial. We're like, wow, we start becoming aware of all this stuff that we just keep blocking off or putting off. And what we don't realize is that we do have a disease and that's called being alive. Like none of us get out of here alive. We all die. We could die tomorrow. We could die in 20 years. You know, you could die in a week. You have no idea. So just reflecting on that just brings a lot more authentic data and gets you much more aligned with what is authentic to you uh, in my experience. Well, um, it's kind of personal to me because about three months ago, I had a near-death experience. Mm. I suffered a stroke, which you can see signs of. I don't really have use of my left side of my body. And that stroke, um, if it wasn't for my wife who was there next to me in the car I was driving, I probably would have died. I would have gotten in a horrible accident or I would have had irreparable brain damage right now. I came very close to dying and um, it did shake me up and it did kind of alter. So I wrote that chapter and that's a chapter I feel very strongly about, but it was brought home to me in a very visceral manner. Mm. And I remember I did a book with 50 Cent that you yeah. interviewed me about and 50 had a near-death experience uh, much stronger than mine. Somebody shot a gun that distance right through his mouth, through his jaw, and he took nine bullets. And he saw that proverbial light as he lay in this hospital bed, that light that comes from, oh, I'm about to die. And I noticed that people like that, or even with myself, after that sense of experience, there's a certain calmness that comes over you. Like nothing really will phase you anymore. Because what could compare, what could be worse than what you've already been through? So I have this feeling that the fact that we live in a culture that's very avoidant of death. Human nature is such that even from primitive times, we're the only animal that's aware of our own mortality. And it's had a profound impact on us. It's part of what led to the creation of religions and the belief of an afterlife, that we're all going to maybe go to a heaven. You know, so we're very much afraid, deeply afraid of this feeling of death. And in our culture, it has a different form. We don't maybe believe in the afterlife, but what we do is we deny death very deeply. We deny its presence. We never see anybody who dies. You know, 200 years ago, you were around people in your house or on the streets. You saw literally somebody die. It had a very visible presence to you. You saw animals were being killed so that you could eat them, right? Death had a presence. We have now banished it to hospitals and to factory farms where chickens are slaughtered. We never have to confront it. And when we watch movies, we see a hundred people being shot with a machine gun, but it's like a cartoon. It has no reality. So we're living in a world in, we are in deep, deep denial of the fact that we are mortal creatures. And I believe that with that denial comes a great deal of latent anxiety in your life. It makes you anxious and fearful for a lot of little smaller things in life, you know, which is why somebody who's had a near-death experience gets rid of that anxiety and doesn't have that kind of avoidant mentality. So I want to open up, I want you to, we tend to turn our back towards death and I want you to turn around and face it square in the eye every single day. It's not a negative thing. It's an immensely beautiful thing. First of all, you know, you are alive. You know you feel that you're alive. But by not realizing that you're dead, that you're contained inside of you, your, your mortality, you're only half alive. You're only dealing with part of the truth. And so in, in Zen philosophy and Samurais, they want you to connect with that dead energy in your gut in your hara right here, so that it'll make you feel more alive. And then realizing that the people around you are going to die will make you connect with them on a much more on a much deeper level. I was recently in New York City and I was walking in the streets and I saw all of these hundreds of people walking around me on Fifth Avenue. And for a moment I was imagining that all of these people are going to die at some point. In 70 years, not one single one of them will be around. And they, maybe they look, maybe I don't like them for this, that, or the other reason. 
But when I think about that fact, I have deep wells of empathy that they are also confronting the same reality that the I am, and they're afraid and they're fearful of it. So confronting this mortality connects you to other people, and it also opens your mind up to something great. I call this the sublime. And I think one of the things that really oppresses people in the world today is that our lives are so immersed in banality, in triviality, in the day-to-day grind. And we have no sense of what is immense about the world. And death is the most immense possible experience. We have no idea what it is. It's like this great, vast darkness. And I say by confronting this thought of your own mortality, you open your mind up to other realities. You open your mind up to the vastness of space and time that, you know, which is a, quite an overwhelming feeling to realize that eight, some three or four billion years ago, life began on this planet. And the fact that you are alive now is extremely, extremely lucky. The set of circumstances that led to your being alive, these kinds of thoughts are sublime thoughts and they come from the fact that you're confronting your mortality and you're opening your mind up to this much wider experience than what you were af- that when you're afraid versus the anxiety ridden and avoidant attitude that most of us feel. So confronting your mortality is perhaps the most liberating step of all and is why I ended the book on that note. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the ultimate confronting reality, not the illusion. It's like life and death. Right. It's the ultimate red pill. That's <laughs> Thank you so much. Enjoy.